Hey, hello everybody and welcome to another episode of Death Guard Fundamentals on the Disgustingly Resilient Podcast. Um, today, uh, as a topic, we're going to be on my list, I don't even need this on. <laughs> today, as a topic, we're basically going to be looking at the fight phase. So this is more based on the basics of the fight phase. Um, so if you're a veteran player, it might not be one for you. But this is going to be one of a two-part series. Uh, the second one, looking at more advanced techniques that you can use in the fight phase. But for now, we want to get a core fundamental um, understanding of the fight phase, what it means for Death Guard, and things you should be looking out for and trying to do within the fight phase. So, before we get into that, if you do enjoy this content, please do leave a like and a subscribe. It really does help the channel. Um, consider becoming a member if that's something you're interested in. Get the benefits of becoming a member. You get to join the Discord. Get to join in some giveaways, vote on upcoming content, etc. And I'm always in there chatting and helping people out as best I can. But yeah, so let's get into it then. So fight phase so things we're going to cover today um when and why to charge is a big topic in itself um we're going to look at reasons why we declare charges why we want to reach uh, close combat um because there is more reasons outside of just trying to kill things um it's quite important that we get all the utility we can out of the charge phase rather than just looking at oh can i kill x thing over there <clears throat> We're going to look at the charge and the fight phase basics, so we get an understanding of how it's all done, things that are limiting within the fight phase, because one thing that's important with a fight phase and charging is not just what you can do, it's also what you can't do, because those are the things that are going to be more used in the advanced section to your advantage, because knowing the limitations of it and how it all works is going to help you be able to almost abuse the system. It's not abuse, it's just plain smart, but ways to get around certain mechanics in the game by using the restrictions of the fight phase and we're going to quickly cover fight phase defense so obviously um fight phase is not just you charging into the opponent you're going to have to be aware of charges coming into you you play against stuff like world eaters etc you'll know this um it's just as important as being aggressive in the fight phase it's having a good fight phase defense so we need to look at that and then obviously we're going to look at Death Guard specifically in the fight phase. So we're going to look at two of our sort of like melee powerhouses, a couple of combos you can do. And we're also going to look at the sort of stratagems as well that are available. So <clears throat> without further ado, why charge in general? So we charge in the game, obviously very basic to kill units. You have a melee unit that deals damage in close combat. You need to charge into enemy units to reach close combat to kill said units. Really simple, but that's not the only reason that we charge. Another great reason for charging is to move block units. Um, when you charge, obviously your models move and you can use these charges to almost lock up certain units, block lanes of approach. <clears throat> and what this means is even if a unit isn't going to be able to kill an enemy unit, sometimes it's just using the movement as movement, so long as you can survive the hit back, you can move block units so they can't get past you because units, unless they have a fly keyword, can't move through your models. So you can basically try and block off avenues of escape, block off buildings, etc. like that. Another reason we charge is to what's called activation locking. So activation locking is basically restricting what your opponent can shoot at and do. So, for example, you have infantry that cannot be shot if they're in engagement range of something. So you might charge a rhino, even though you're not going to kill it with like cultists or whatever. But you're going to wrap the rhino so you're fully around it. So the rhino can't escape unless it tries to desperate escape. But then it dies on a one or a two, which is good for you. Um, <clears throat> but it means the cultist can't be shot by anything other than the rhino. This means the opponent has to either dedicate a charge. Or like I said, they have to commit a fall back and then shoot the unit with something else. So that's two units you've there locked up. Um... It also locks people into decision making. So, for example, you know, you've charged a, like, say, a Redemptor Dreadnought was on a corner and it had a really good chance to move out next turn and get a good angle on you. But instead, you've charged that Redemptor with, again, cultists, nerglings, whatever. Um, in the opponent's turn, let's say you charge 10 cultists. You know, the Redemptor Dreadnought has five attacks. The max it can kill is five guys. We're fine with that. So it's definitely going to still be in combat next turn. The Redemptor Dreadnought now has a choice to make. Basically, he can either fall back and not shoot at all. He can stay in combat and shoot the cultist, but because he can't move, he now can't get that angle that he wanted to to shoot your unit. And this is what we mean by activation locking. We are locking his ability to activate to do what we want him to do, rather than having free reign to do what he wants to do. Okay? 
<coughs> um, we can also do this to lock in certain things that we'll see in the advanced section, such as locking in people where they can fight, etc. like that. Again, we won't touch that too much here. We'll leave that for the um, advanced video, which is going to have in-game like playouts. So we've got some recordings done, so that's going to be quite cool. Um, but yeah, um, obviously extra movement. Movement on an army that moves uh, four and five inches is really important. So potentially getting up to 2d6, you know, double six on the movement. You've got three movement phases worth of movement out of a charge. So sometimes we'll do what's called a springboard charge, which is where we charge something that we're not massively interested in killing, <clears throat> but it gives us a lot of free movement. So I've got two dice here. So just for example, if I roll them, I've got a seven there. So I could charge into some screen unit, some rhino, anything like that. That's within seven inches. And then basically I've got seven inches gained movement, which is equivalent to, to like two movement phases if we're talking about terminators here. So it's very important to look for those chances to springboard a unit to, to you know charge something that kill it and bounce into something else. Um, it's really important to find, especially for slower armies like us. And another one is obviously to extend contagions. Um, <clears throat> Charging again, extra movement, getting stuff into the opponent's lines means your contagion is now spreading. This is extremely important if you're rocking like the minus one weapon skill, minus one ballistic skill contagion, because being able to charge into a unit with like a bloat drone, piling around the back, spreads it into their lines. Now we may be tagging some, you know, tanks that we're going to shoot. So now they're going to have to either move and get a bad line of sight, or they're going to suffer the minus one to hit. So it's all sorts of benefits for getting in there with our death guard units to spread those contagions around, spread those debuffs around, and overall be a bit of a pain in the ass. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so things to consider. So when we make a charge, we need to always think about the things that are on this screen. One, what happens if I fail this charge? So if you're going to deep strike in nine inches away in the open to try and you know smash out a nine inch charge, you need two dice. What happens if you fail it? Well, now I'm stood in the open with pants down. And, oh, look at that. There's a two Rogal Dawn staring me down from the uh, guard player. Um, I'm dead. <laughs> um, so we need to understand that if we're going to do this, there is a risk. Um, so now we do the same scenario. Maybe we teleport in behind a building instead. Maybe we do a rapid ingress to make an easier charge. Um, but well, let's just do the from behind a building. So we're going to try and charge out from behind a building. We roll the nine, we don't get it, we fail the charge, but because we're behind a building, we're still safe from being shot by those two Rogal Dons. So always remember, in that scenario, if you, whenever you're making a charge, even if it's a four inch charge, always think about what happens if this charge goes wrong, because that's something you're gonna have to take into account, because we've all had the double one re-rolled into a double one. It happens. <clears throat> On the flip side, we need to talk about the impact of successful charges. Um, so, <coughs> I apologize, I've got a bit of a cough at the moment. <clears throat> what is the impact if this charge pays off? So, for example, this is something that needs to be weighed against the impact of a failed charge. So, maybe the nine inch charge into the two Rogal Dawn field of fire is really dumb. <coughs> However, you are losing the game. You're losing the game very badly. And the only way you're going to get back in this game is to make a nine inch charge at a deep strike into that Rogal Dawn and kill one of them. Now, that's gone from a dumb charge into a extremely risky, potentially game ending charge. But <clears throat> if you want a chance at winning the game, maybe it's your only out. Maybe that crazy play is what's required to try and get the win out of this loss. Um, but you can also think in more general terms. If I make this charge, I can kill this unit, then I can consolidate into this unit and lock them up next turn. So that's actually getting like two benefits there. Um, so we've got to weigh up the imp impact of our charges and which ones are the most important. This leads on to the next point, which is secondary effects of a charge. <clears throat> I have charged X unit, I have killed them, um, or I have damaged them. Now, what can this lead to? Can I damage them below half? Do they now have to take a Battleshock test? Are we on an objective? Therefore... I can flip an objective, so regardless of the outcome, I've charged the tank, I haven't killed the tank, but I've flipped the objective, so now I've denied my opponent primaries, um, I've managed to pile into another unit, tag that one as well, I've managed to wrap and trap this vehicle so it can't escape, all sorts of things are secondary effects of charges rather than just shooting. <clears throat> Did I charge into a good position to get me extra movement? That's another secondary effect. 
these are things you always want to be looking out for it's not just the direct impact of i make a charge i land the charge i kill the unit try and think of <clears throat> other things that can happen and again the advanced section is going to make the, a lot of these more obvious to you but trying to find secondary effects of a charge is going to help you maximize your charges so again always try and charge and flip an objective for example because that gives you a double bonus and again you could whiff the attacks it's potential you know <clears throat> hit on fours or heavy play weapons i watched on stream the other day plastic crackheads the guy rolled literally like <laughs> 12 one twos and threes it happens but he charged onto an objective so he still flipped the objective worst case scenario uh, so small win rather than the big win it shouldn't <clears throat> uh, in that activation um Another thing to consider is obviously opponent stratagems. Um, you don't want to walk into a eight inch charge only to then find out your opponent has a six inch reactive move. And now once again, you stood in the open with your pants down. Um, <clears throat> does your opponent have access to fights first? Like custodies with a stratagem, minus one damage, all these things. So always ask your opponent many times, especially if you're new to the game and you're learning other armies. Um, hey, can you do anything in the fight phase? Hey, do you have any reactive moves? <clears throat> Most opponents will tell you about these things um, if they're not a dick. Um, they should be quite open with it because gotchas are the worst thing in 40k. Most opponents don't want to have a, you know, a gotchas. <clears throat> so be aware these things exist. We need to understand them. Um, so, you know, again, we're talking about impacts of successful and failed charges. If I successfully make this charge, will I force my opponent to spend like 2 CP for minus 1 damage? Because maybe that's going to open up uh, something else next turn. Maybe he won't have the command points to auto pass, you know, certain things that he might need to do here, there, and everywhere. Um, he might not be able to get that auto, you know, put two units into reserves because he's going to have to save a CP to pass the battle shock in case. All sorts of things like that. <coughs> um, and another one, the last one here. How is the opponent going to react to your charge? So <coughs> you can normally tell, put, your opponent, put yourself in your opponent's shoes, if I make this charge and I kill this unit, what is the opponent's counter charge? What is the opponent's counter shooting? And sometimes <clears throat> knowing this helps inform us of other charges that need to be made. Again, we talk about the Redemptor Dreadnought can get a good angle. Um, but now maybe again, you could just charge it with 10 cultists. They're not going to hurt the damn thing. But now you can stop his ability to react to your successful, other successful charge. Um, this makes your opponent then have to, you know, pull some out of his ass basically. And even if you don't have any other setup like that if you can say right okay if i get 10 blight lord terminators for example and they make this rapid ingress charge onto my opponent's like safe objective if my opponent's reaction is going to take his entire army's firepower to potentially kill this unit that means when you've played your turn out you need to understand they're going to eat so much firepower next turn the rest of your army is kind of free to make riskier moves and riskier approaches because the firepower is going to be drawn by the Blight Lords making this charge and taking an objective that needs to be cleared off. <clears throat> so these are things that you need to sort of consider. Where will my opponent move? What will his game plan be? And again, this is all about the thought of making this charge and the impact of it successfully happening and playing out how you want it to. And again, way up to the failed start, uh, the failed charge status. Because again, we don't want to just give away free kills, etc. Okay. <clears throat> I like to split charges into two different categories. Control and combat. Control charges are things that are looking to do things like forcing fallbacks on opponents in units. So, you know, you tag shooting units. Again, you're not looking to kill it. But it's either got to stay in combat or, you know, it has to shoot out of combat at minus one to hit. But then again, it can't get the angles it wants. There's things like this. So you're basically forcing the opponent to fall back. Um, this is even better if you're an infantry unit. Because again, you can't be shot par the vehicle that you're in combat with. Um, if you're locked in engagement range. So sometimes you might. Um, and I see this all the time. Um, I've had 10 plague marines with all the heavy plague weapons in the world. Charge a rhino. Wrap it. And then, instead of using the, the heavy play weapon, because they still have plague knives, I'll swing with a plague knife instead. Because the plague knife has a much less chance of killing the rhino. And what that means is, I get to stay in combat with the rhino. A lot of people won't want to fall back a rhino or a vehicle or a tank, etc. <clears throat> knowing if they roll a 1 or a 2, it's going to automatically die. So what they'll do is, instead, they'll let you stay in combat. Then in your opponent's turn, you swing with your big weapons, kill the tank. 
and you've basically been unable to be shot, you, so you haven't been touched at all by shooting, you've now killed their tank in their turn, and now you're free to act again in your own turn. So, forcing your opponent to have to make those fallback choices um, is really nasty for people, and people don't like doing it. And again, if you make something really big fallback, like a Rogal Dawn, or you know, something like a, a big shooty knight, or something like that, especially if they've got blast weapons, that unit's not doing anything for a turn. Unless they've got fallback and shoot, again, always be asking these questions. But being able to force fallback and stop things activating is just as good as activation locking. <clears throat> um, another one is move blocking. So, again, as we talked about, stopping stuff moving out. I had a game recently against Custodes at the Land Raider. Turn one, I had Cultist, move, advance, scout, char uh, move, uh, scout, <coughs> scout, move, and then charge into a, a land raider. Um, again, no hope of hurting the thing, uh, but what it does do is it meant that that land raider couldn't move out, so the warden brick inside it couldn't deploy into you know an aggressive charge. So basically I've bought myself an entire turn of, of time, uh, or he has to get the wardens out and walk around the cultists, which really limits how much they get to move as well. So, <clears throat> using charges for move blocking and again as we get into advanced there'll be ways to find out that you can actually not have to base to base your opponent you can string out and do all sorts of crazy stuff which are going to prevent your opponent from moving restrict their options and that's going to be great for you in the long run so one second a quick sip um, another example of control charging is preventing overwatch um, let's say your opponent has a really scary land raid redeemer you don't want to get overwatched it by it when you declare a charge with your 10 plague greens. So instead we're going to charge in the free nurglings first. <clears throat> um, because once the unit is engaged in uh, close combat it can no longer fire overwatch. So you can have the nurglings charge in first. Maybe your opponent decides to overwatch the nurglings. In which case the nurglings might die. But again rather than nurglings and the 10 plague marines because they can't double overwatch. So then the plague marines can move in and make that charge. Or... Alternatively, they decide not to overwatch the Nurglings, the Nurglings make the charge, and then because the vehicle is now in close combat, or the unit is in close combat, etc., the Plague Marines can take make the charge without the threat of overwatch at all, okay? Um, and as we said before, shooting protection, so this is, I'm not trying to kill the unit, I'm going to swing with the Plague Knives, I'm just going to try and wrap it, stay in combat, so in my opponent's turn, they aren't going to be able to shoot my unit. And even just something like having a vehicle into a vehicle, um, <clears throat> Plague Burst Crawls, for example, if you've got Mortarion especially, because we ignore the penalties for hit rolls, I'll often just charge tanks into other tanks to just hit them, because it, what it means is I'm minus one to be hit because of my vehicle in close combat being shot, but when I shoot out, I'm ignoring that minus one because Mortarion exists, and I also have Flamers, which don't need to hit. So, this can help you get like free, basically, Cloud of Flies all around the place, because you're getting free minus ones to hit, and again, you know, worst case scenario, they fall back whatever you've charged, that unit's now not shooting. So if you've charged a predator or something, that unit isn't shooting now, which is great. So then on the flip side, we have combat charges. So again, this is your more generic um, charges. You're expecting to kill units. You're looking to flip objectives, whether that's killing enough OC off the point um, or just trying to take the objective by force. Um, Character sniping, there is ways to give precision in close combat to your characters, so this is great if you have like a, a really tough unit like six Necron Wraiths with a Technomancer, you can use the combat phase to get in there, kill the Technomancer with precision attacks, and then that Necron Wraith unit is much more vulnerable to shooting because it's lost its feel no pain. <clears throat> uh, tank shocking, um, obviously tank shock is a really nice way to get easy mortals. Um, so you have to charge to make a tank shock. So if you're after some quick bottles, maybe you've left some on one or two wounds, you just want to get it gone, but you've only got a rhino or a bloat drone around. You don't trust the free attacks on the rhino or the free attacks on the bloat drone. So instead you charge in, you pop a tank shock, and you hopefully, even on six dice, you should average roll two. So you get those two mortals there and chip it away and kill the last guy. If it's infantry, you probably get eight dice, and that'll definitely more than likely get you two or three mortal wounds. Um, and obviously wrap and trapping, so this is the act of uh, trapping something, this is also a control charge really, but it can be a <coughs> combat charge because again, you're looking to trap stuff in there, keep it in close combat with you, it could protect you from shooting, but it also lets you kill it in their turn and then be free again in your turn. So this little techniques, again that's going to be covered in the advanced section, don't worry too much if you're not too familiar with the terms wrap and trap. <coughs> 
Um, so, um, yeah, charge phase basic. So, really quickly, we're just going to go through this. These are things you need to understand and have to drill into your head. They're very, very important because from these, we extract all the other advanced techniques that we're going to learn. Um, so, when we declare charges, we pick as many targets we want within 12 inches, we roll 2d6, and we have to, on that roll, be able to reach engagement range, which is at least 1 inch. Um, if you have declared multiple targets, you must reach engagement range of all targets. If you cannot, then you are unable to make the charge. So if you've got a one unit six inches away, a second eight inches away, and you roll a six, yep, yeah, okay, cool, you can get to the first one, but because you can't get to the second one and you declared it, you fail that charge and you don't charge it any. So be aware of that. <clears throat> um, now the restrictions. You can't move within one inch of a non-declared target, and if a model can reach base-to-base -base contact, it must. Remember this, it's going to become very important in the advanced section because there are, we read this now, but it is not the case. Um, there are many ways to game this and to work around it so that you can basically prevent base-to-base -base contact to yourself, which means you can then finish your charge anywhere. Um, and again, more of an advanced section, but understand these restrictions. If a model can base, it has to base. You cannot finish a charge within one inch of a non-declared target. Okay, just remember that. <clears throat> um, so fight phase basics. So again, we're just going to go through the very basics. Activation process. So all units that have fights first or have made a charge move this turn will go before everyone else. The non-active player, aka if it's my turn, my opponent is the non-active player, they will have priority in this phase. Okay, so they will pick the first unit to fight. So even if I have fights first, they have fights first. If it's my turn, my opponent goes first, okay? So he has a fight first unit, I charge into it, so I have charge bonus. We go to the fights first and charge selection. Non active player goes first, which is my opponent. He picks that unit, he fights before me. <clears throat> it also means if we have fights first, <coughs> foul blight spawn, and the opponent charges us, we will go first. Then after that, you go into ongoing combat. So this is any combat that has had no charges take place and has no fights first ability. And once again, the non-active player has priority to go first. And it's I go, you go. So the opponent goes first, then I go, then you go, then I go. Okay. <clears throat> For a unit to be, when a unit is selected to fight, it is able to pile in three inches to the nearest enemy. Has to go to the nearest enemy. If it can base, it has to base. Um, you make melee attacks and then you will consolidate three inches to engagement so if there's an enemy model or unit you can consolidate three inches to engagement again have to base and if there isn't an enemy unit you can instead consolidate to an objective within three inches now if there is both an objective and an enemy unit it is not a choice you have to go to the enemy unit if you wish to consolidate at all so don't let people be like oh no i'll just go into the point if you have guys near you like nope you have to come into me Okay. Uh, one important thing, quickly before we go ahead, the when a unit is selected to fight, it is activated, and when a unit is activated, it sees this full process. This, this selected to fight is seen fully through. So you can't pile into somewhere and then they go, "Oh, I've got fights first. No, I've already activated the unit. I get to see this full procedure through. I pile in free. I make melee attacks. I consolidate. Then your opponent can do something." Okay. <clears throat> So, the limits, and again, the limits are sometimes more important than the actual, um, not the things you can do. Any Which units can activate? A unit can be picked to fight if it is within one inch of an enemy unit. Engagement range, that's very basic, very easy. Also, a unit can always activate if it's made a charge move that turn. So, if you've successfully made a charge move, even if your opponent is dead, so you, maybe you've charged with a vehicle, into a guy on one wound, you base to base him, you press tank shock, he's now dead, okay? There is no one within an inch. You are still eligible to activate. What this means, if there is an enemy unit within four inches, you can pile into them because three inch piling will get you to an inch engagement range, which means you're still eligible to fight that unit even though you didn't declare them as a charge. So again, advanced techniques, we'll get to it, but if you've made a charge move, regardless of whether you're in combat or not, you can activate, okay? Which models can attack? Models can attack any enemy unit with an engagement range, so within one inch. Um, you can also swing 
base to base with an ally who is base to base with an enemy. So this lets you fight like a rowback, but it has to be all base contact. So you have to be base to base with your friendly model, and that friendly model has to be base to base with an enemy model. Okay? <clears throat> that is more limiting than you think, and there's ways to we're gonna use this to get around certain things like fight first by model locking. Um because basically um, when you do stuff like pilings, which is another limit, pilings, etc., you can't do pilings if you are already in base to base contacts, which means you can't move, which means you can only swing at what you're in base to base contact with. So remember this. Um, again, when we go into the advanced section, you'll see why. <clears throat> okay, some very quick basic charging tips. Seven inches is roughly safe. Um, it's the average on 2d6. You should be able to bank on a seven inch charge. Still recommend keeping a reroll. <clears throat> Anything higher than that, you are putting it to the gods to decide your fate. Um, sometimes it's going to work, sometimes it's not. Such is the fate of melee armies in this game. Um, not only do we have to walk for all the shooting, you've then got to make the dreaded 2d6. Um, but <clears throat> try and get seven inch charges at a max is what I'd probably say. Um, learn to use rapid ingress. So rapid ingress is one of the most powerful stratagems in the game. You basically get to teleport in on your opponent's turn in the end of their movement phase, which means that when it comes to your turn, your unit can then move and make a charge. So <clears throat> nine inch deep strike on our terminators, then it's our turn. We can walk four forward or five with Typhus. And now we've got a five inch charge or a four inch charge instead of a nine inch charge. It's very powerful. It's one of the most powerful stratagems in the game. Please start using rapid ingress and learning to use it. <clears throat> um, Rhino staging. So I'm not going to go into this. We've covered it in the deployment fundamentals. So if you haven't don't know about Rhino staging, please do go and check that out. We do a full section on Rhino staging and why it's so important. But remember, <clears throat> setting up Rhinos in good points along the map gives you tons of board control, and it's going to help you set up those charges with the eight-inch move because you get the three-inch disembark, five-inch move makes those charges a lot easier. <clears throat> Um, another good tip is, if you're measuring ranges to charges, try and charge the characters, especially if you're looking to shoot the unit first, because one problem I see a lot is someone will set up a charge, like a 7 inch charge to a unit, then they'll shoot it and soften it up, and your opponent will kill the closest models, so you're making your charge harder, um, because as they pull models away, the charge is getting further and further, and that 7 inch charge is now a 9. <clears throat> Instead, if you measure to a character, because characters have to take wounds last, this means you can guarantee make that charge never change distance. So you can shoot with a million guns as long as that character's alive, in which case the unit is not dead. Um, if the character's dead, you've killed the entire unit with shooting, so you probably don't need the charge anymore. <coughs> um, but you can reliably know that that range is not going to change for that charge, okay? Um, next one, obviously, roll priority charges first. If you have a charge that is way more important to make than any of the others, that's the one you want to do first because you need the information to know whether you need the charge reroll from the command point reroll. Because no, other, no worse feeling in the world than charging a charge over there doesn't really matter, failing it, and you go, oh, CP roll, roll it. My important charge there is only a four. You go to do your important charge and you roll a double bloody one. It happens, and then you're like, great, I've just lost the entire game off that. Priority charge, the most important charge, always roll it first because it will inform your entire turn of what you need to do. If you make it, great. If not, CP re-roll it. Hopefully you make it. If not, then you might need to change your plans on the go. <clears throat> okay? And always try and find secondary goals. This is what we said about move blocking, activation locking, stealing objectives, all these kind of things that you can try and achieve whilst making your charges to kill units. Okay? <clears throat> um, when we talk about defending against melee, we want to use things like screen units. So a screen unit, for those that don't know, are cheap units designed to block and absorb charges. So block movement and absorb charges. This is stuff like units 10 Poxwalkers, 3 Nurglings, 10 Cultists. Units you don't really care about losing. And what they'll usually do is they'll stand as a literal screen of men, of bodies, in front of your army. So if you're in something like World Eaters, there's very little shooting. You worry about your tanks getting charged. If you just put 10 guys in front of them, about 4 inches away... <coughs> It means the World Eater player will have to charge and kill that unit first before they can touch your tank. So what this means is you can keep yourself safe from being charged into your vital assets by using other cheaper units to absorb the charges. And then in your turn, you can either shoot or counter charge back. Okay, <clears throat> um, 
Space out these screens, you want to maximise the footprint on the board, take up as much room as you can to block as much as you can. Um, so always be there with your measuring stick going two inches between each guy for coherency and just making it as big as it can to block as much movement as you can. <clears throat> um, Pre-measuring. So pre-measuring is simply the act of asking your opponent, how far does that guy move? You go, okay, cool, seven, whatever. You measure seven inches from that unit. Can it advance and charge? Yes, okay. Add six on just in case. And then it rolls 2d6, so add 12 on. That's the maximum threat range of a unit. So if you really don't want to get charged, you just stay out of that bubble completely. And you are no risk, you cannot be charged. Now, <clears throat> you can obviously go into that bubble, but try and keep, again, those unsafe distances for charges, those nine inch charges, those 10 inch charges. Because that's really gonna put off your opponent of trying to, you know, wanna take that risk and take that charge. Because again, they're gonna be thinking of the impact of a failed charge. <clears throat> You, you measure it out and you go, okay, my unit's here, which means if you roll a six on the advance, you'll still need a 10 inch charge. Is your opponent gonna risk needing a six on advance and then a nine inch charge? Probably not. <laughs> so they're probably not gonna do it, which means you're relatively safe. If they do try it, they might get it, they might not. Uh, again, it's still a dice game, luck plays a part, but if they fail it, you're gonna have a good chance to punish that. <clears throat> and then another one is obviously Overwatch. We have lots of flamers in our army as Death Watch, a Death Guard. The fucking hell, Death Watch. Jesus Christ, I'm becoming a loyalist. <laughs> as Death Guard, it's because it's Overwatch. That's what threw me off. It's Overwatch, Death Guard, Death Watch. I'm innocent. Nurgle, forgive me. <laughs> um, but obviously, Overwatch is great. Um, we have lots of flamers that we can punish charges with. Flamers automatically hit. Normally, when you Overwatch, you need sixes to hit. But auto hit weapons still auto hit. So your opponent can maybe, <clears throat> you see them coming in for a charge, you're like, oh no, this is really going to hurt. Suddenly, you do a rapid ingress out of nowhere, behind the guys they're planning to charge within flamer range, and you look at your opponent and go, go ahead, make that charge, mate, because when you declare that charge, I'm going to overwatch you with 8d6 flamers with full rerolls to wound from this Lord of Irulans. Good night, mate, at AP1, tatty bye. Um... The great deterrence, even just having like a plague burst crawler with the flamers lurking nearby is going to really put people off because people just hate being overwatched. It's, it is terrifying. Um, so again, always consider trying to set up lanes of board control and area denial with overwatch and that's going to help you defend against melee as well. So I'm going to quickly go through some fight phase stratagems and what they're good at. Um, Epic challenge is the one that lets you give a character precision. Um, so this lets you basically snipe out characters from enemy units. So you make a charge in, say you've got Death Shroud of a Lord of Contagion. You, the opponent, again, the Technomancer and Wraith's um, <coughs> um, example. The Technomancer is giving the Wraith unit feel no pain. You want to get rid of that. Um, so you will play the stratagem. Lord of Contagion can swing directly at the Technomancer. Good chance at lopping his head off. And this means after this activation that feel no pain will be gone. So you've got rid of that synergy, that that impact to the opposing unit. Even better if it's an offensive buff, because what it means is if you swing first, you kill the character, all those offensive buffs are now removed from the unit, um, which means that they're going to have a lot worse damage output towards you. One thing you need to remember with this, though, is that activations are simultaneous. So even though the Lord of Contagion has took that Technomancer's head off, when the Death Shroud from his squad swing into the Wraiths, they're still going to have the Feel No Pain because the, him and the unit activate at the same time, which means that buff is still technically up. However, if you had like Mortarian and he's his own unit and he swung first and precisioned out the Technomancer and killed it, and then the secondary unit of the Death Shroud and the Lord of Contagion, then they swung, they wouldn't have the Feel No Pain because that is a different unit activating, okay? Um, but yeah, and also it's great for scoring assassination if you need it. Go bop that character. <laughs> um, counter offensive is an interesting one. It's very expensive, but it can win games. Immediately um, after an enemy unit is fought, you pick one of your units and fight. We call it the interrupt stratagem. So if your opponent has made multiple charges, so they've done two charges, but you've got two command points, your opponent will go first because they have the charging unit. Um, but then, rather than letting their second charging unit go again, um, you can pay two command points, interrupt the normal sequence of operations, pick one of your units anywhere and instantly fight. 
So this lets you do what's the interrupt. So if you have, you know, two squads of 10 Plague Marines, you haven't got a Foul Blight spawn for reasons, and you've been charged by two squads of free 8-bound, <clears throat> one of them will activate and chop up one of your guys. It's going to happen, nothing you can do. But then you can pay two command points to interrupt the second squad. So the second squad won't have swung yet, and you get to go first, potentially kill them before they swing. So it's really good. If you sit on two command points in the fight phase, it's really nice to basically just say to your opponent, hey, <clears throat> maybe don't make two charges, because at any point I can just go press these two, two command points and actually swing before you can. Um, so it's great as a deterrent, okay? Um, and always look at your opponent's CP, because again, they can do this to you. Um, <clears throat> so be aware, you don't want to make loads of charges if they can interrupt. Um, and what's even cheekier is... Um, so remember how I said your opponent always swings, uh, activates the first unit in the because you're a non-controlling player? If it's your turn and you have an ongoing combat, let's say I have Mortarion on two wounds and he's in combat with three sword brethren. So if Mortarion swings, he'll probably kill him. But the problem is, because it's my turn and that's an ongoing combat, <clears throat> my opponent's going to get to go first with the sword brethren um, because non-controlling player. I can do something really fucking stupid, such as charging a unit of Nurglings into an enemy fight first unit like a Judica. He has to activate that unit first because it's fight first, and then I can pay two command points to immediately activate Mortarion. So there's weird little interactions that are once every blue moon, but if you are aware that it's there as an option, they can swing games completely open because now what should have been a dead Mortarion because your opponent thought, yeah, I'm going to swing first next turn. He's now suddenly three dead sword brethren and a surviving Mortarion, <laughs> which he now has to go and deal with. So look for weird little things like that too. <clears throat> um, heroic intervention, um, again, expensive, hard to use properly. If an enemy unit finishes a charge within six inches of one of your units um, that has not been charged, you basically get to make a counter charge. One thing to note is this doesn't grant fight first though, so your opponent will still swing before you, which is kind of annoying. <clears throat> um, it's a great charge turret though, but it's expensive. So what this means is if you have, for example, um, Mortarion, some Death Shroud near him, he's charged Mortarion, it's within six of the Death Shroud, you can pay two command points, and you basically get to make a counter charge with the Death Shroud, so I'll roll it now, I get a six, so I would just barely make it. So then my Death Shroud can get involved in the fight. Where this becomes more interesting though, <clears throat> is when you do it with like Plague Marines with a Foul Blight spawn because they do have fight first. So again, same scenario. Five Sword Brethren have charged Mortarion. I'm now going to do my Heroic Intervention with my Plague Marines. Let me roll these two dice here. I get the six again, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> they will now counter charge and because they have the fight first from the Foul Blight spawn, it's my opponent's turn, which means I get to activate first with any fights first I have. The Plague Marines can actually swing before the Sword Brethren. And now, what's hap what's gone from the Sword Brethren charge Mortarion and slapping him has actually gone from the Sword Brethren charge Mortarion, Plague Marines heroic intervention, and they will swing before the Sword Brethren and potentially kill them. So, very powerful on units with fights first, this. <clears throat> um, another thing you can do is, if your opponent's trying to do something cheeky, like absorbing Overwatch with like a Rhino, but you have cultists nearby, <clears throat> the Rhino comes in, you heroic intervention with the cultists, and then actually make a meat wall to block the actual unit that wanted to charge and deal the damage. So you can actually block off other charges that are coming in. Again, I'll have examples in the advanced one when we get to it, but there's all sorts of tricks you can do with this. The main problem with heroic intervention is it's two bloody command points. So half the time you won't have the command points to do it because it's so expensive. Not in this economy, boys. <laughs> <clears throat> but it's good um, Another one is tank shock So immediately after a vehicle only Vehicle not monster, no Marty <clears throat> um, Finishes a charge They roll dice equal to their strength if the strength Or strength of a weapon they have If the strength is higher than the target's toughness You get to add 2 more dice So if you're strength 6, their toughness 3 You get 6 dice for strength 6 Your strength's higher than toughness 3 So you get another 2, so you have 8 dice <clears throat> You roll them all And every 5 up some mortal wound Capped at 6 it's really nice, really good way to do mortal wounds. And as you'll see in the advanced section, because of the timing of this strategy, it can make so many weird things happen. Um, you get to fight stuff you shouldn't fight. You get to do all sorts of nonsense with it. But again, we'll save that for the advanced one. 
So let's look at Death Guard melee specifically. So um, Death Guard damage output, it's really good in melee. Um, every melee weapon we have is basically lethal hits, power like defiles and stuff like that. But again, they're more generic units. <coughs> um, so what this means is um, toughness isn't too much of an issue. Six is to hit, just automatically wound. Um, we have great melee profiles. We have um, heavy plague weapons are great profile. Eight two two, three attacks each. <coughs> weapon skill four is a bit iffy, but again we can fix that with biologists. Um, Man reapers, weapon skill two, eight two two, really good. Lethal hits, four attacks each, really good. Even bubotic weapons, four attacks at five two one with lethal hits is actually quite impressive. And even a humble plague knife having three attacks each with lethal hits can really add up. Um, and one thing we can do, we can get absurd AP levels. Um, minus one save contagion, plus heavy plague weapons, or bootbike weapons, whatever, man reapers. That's now AP3 melee. You can pay a command point to put it to AP4 melee. You have in range of an infected objective marker that can potentially be AP6, AP5 melee, which is absurd. A two up save land raider literally wouldn't get a save, which is super daft. <coughs> but that makes us very deadly against things that don't have invulnerables. Um, Sanguinous Flux Strat is obviously really good, having sustained hits 1 and potentially 2 if you're on an infected objective back on the defense is really nice. Very good combination there with Biology Putrefire, giving us crits on 5s, so there's a lot more damage output to get all those exploding attacks. Um, it's just a great little stratagem, one, you know, one command point, sustained hits is always good. <coughs> Contagions are always in effect in melee, because again, if you're in melee, you're in contagion range. Um, the biggest thing is the question of do you want to be offensive or a defensive player? Minus one save, minus weapon skill and ballistic skill. Kind of comes down to personal preference and matchup. You'll learn this as you play more. Um, but <coughs> I like minus one save most of the time. Um, but I know a lot of people that prefer the minus one ballistic skill and weapon skill. It's all player preference. So, let me look at this again. So the two main powerhouses for our army in melee... Are definitely playing Marines and, and the next one's Death Shroud. Playing Marines can actually take up to nine melee weapons. Four bubotic, four heavy, because you get two per five guys. Um, so in a ten man, you have four of each. <clears throat> and the sergeant can take an additional one. That is an insane amount of AP2 weaponry for a battle line unit. Um, and some of it's damage two at strength eight, some of it's strength five. Combined with the minus one save contagion, it's an absurd amount of AP3 weaponry. Power armor, our enemies get cleaved apart by us. It's grim. It's so brutal. But it's really good. It's really good damage output. I don't suggest going full melee, but the option is there for you. Um, <clears throat> and it just means that this unit can smack so goddamn hard. Uh, you pretty much, If you go full melee and you make a charge of all 10, you pretty much pick up most things in the game. Um, but yeah. <laughs> um, the biggest choice with Virians is the in uh, Virians that you sorry with Plague Marines is the Virians you attach. Um, so these can vary from crits on fives with the Biology Pooch Fire, who is pretty much auto take. Um, getting lethal hits on fives means that strength five of like bubotic weapons just isn't an issue. Um, lethal hits on fives is just kind of daft and a bit broken. Um, <clears throat> but it also means if you use the command point stratagem for sustained hits, that's also going to trigger on a five. So you have a fives and sixes are going to be lethal and sustained, which again just takes this unit that already has really good output and just cranks it to a whole nother level. Um, the next one is the um, bio, uh, Foul Blight Spawn with the Fights First. Um, so obviously Fights First is really good, means your opponent can't charge you in their turn without you swinging first. Again, there are ways around it, but it's still really nice to have. It presents your opponent a problem they need to try and solve. <coughs> it's really good for defending objectives. And there's also the cheeky heroic intervention plays we mentioned before. <coughs> um, Talima, plus one to hit. It's just a nice solid buff. It's not my go-to, but hitting on twos with robotic weapons and plague knives, and then hitting on threes instead of fours with heavy plague weapon is actually quite big. So that's really nice. So if you just want to get maximum damage output, Talima and Biological Pooch Fire by far is probably the highest output you can get. <coughs> but again... I still prefer the fight first access there because it's just a problem your opponent has to try and work around and being able to do cheeky heroic intervention plays is also nice but the tallyman is still a decent choice <clears throat> and then the noxious bright bringer who has reroll advances and charges um, that's pretty good again saves you from having to you know worry about keeping a cp for the charge reroll because you immediately have one for free and sometimes it'll absolutely save your ass sometimes you'll never need it 
it's just the way it goes. Um, he also helps you, you know, enemies fail battle shock sometimes, which can help in ongoing combats. But output wise, he doesn't really help out too much. He's more there to try and increase your chances of making the charge in the first place. Not terrible, not great. <coughs> um, but yeah, um, again, as I said before, the high AP of this unit, the amount of attacks of good quality AP attacks it gets is what really sets this unit apart, especially for a battle line unit with the OC2. So it's really easy to get those secondary goals of trading onto points and taking the objective regardless of how much you kill. <clears throat> and in general, it lets play Marines up trade. We've talked about trading, which is the, the essence of you using a unit of lesser value to kill some of higher value. And Plague Marines are really good at that because of the amount of special weapons that they have. Five Plague Marines will beat up pretty much most battle line in the game, par like Custodes. Um, Custodes Shield Guard obviously being quite absurd battle line as well. But Plague Marines against anything like Intercessors, Legionnaires, anything like that, will beat up most of them nine times out of ten and come out the victor. <coughs> Next one is Death Shroud. So Death Shroud is obviously a lot less... Um, options to it, which is kind of good in a way. Um, you're just going to get a lot of flamers and a lot of man reapers. <laughs> <clears throat> the biggest question with Death Shroud is do you prefer them in threes or sixes? Three man units make fantastic bully units. They're great to drop in, go and bully some object some guys that can't really fight them back off an objective. You don't really want to go to fight toe to toe over elites because they're good and they can fight them, to be honest, they can, but you, they're not there to crack the massive bricks. So you don't want to send them into like 10 Terminators. That's more of a job for the six-man unit. That's more like a big hammer blow unit that's going to drop in. That's going to be your big, I'm going to end this game and slam into them. <clears throat> now, to consider this, we have to think about strats and buff efficiency. Um, obviously, bigger squad means that the strat costs the same regardless of the squad size. So, using a stratagem on a bigger squad is technically more efficient use of the stratagem rather than using it on a three-man squad. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't use it on a three-man squad, but <clears throat> you should definitely look at the value comparison between them um, and obviously if you're bringing buffs think about how efficient the buffs are that you bring in because obviously for example lord of virulence reroll wounds on flamers is going to have a lot more impact the more flamers that you bring which means the more bodies the more rerolls <coughs> okay um the question again for these guys really is the best character i'm really sorry my throat's getting really dry so i'm probably going to wrap this up soon it's damn cough, man. It's Nurgles, bless me. <laughs> Just in time for Manchester. <clears throat> um, so the Lord of Contagion is kind of like your offensive character. He doesn't really offer you much else apart from getting into melee and hitting really hard. He gives the unit full rolls to hit, which is great because it means you can fish for lethal hits. And his own weapon, especially if you take Deadly Pathogen and he gets 6 attacks at damage flat free. It slaps so fucking hard. Um, I love the Lord of Contagion. I, I'm not running him at the moment, but man do I miss him. Plus it's not only that, it's just it's just a sick model. Like I got mine right here right now. It's just a sick model. Um but the fact that he can just like come in with his flat damage free up and he's great for like challenging uh, characters in precision. Um and just flat free damage is really, really good. He's the guy that I actually prefer him in three man squads because he brings so much damage himself. He kind of gets the problem of free ban, which is sometimes the output isn't enough. And he kind of just fixes it. He's like, I'm going to give you all full rerolls to hit so you can fish for lethals. And oh, by the way, boys, I'm also here with my six attacks because I always give him deadly pathogen. Flat three, strength nine. I'm going to come in. I'm going to rip someone's face off. Um, absolutely love him. Fantastic unit. Super underrated. And he's also just really fun because when you get in there and you pick up those six dice, you're like, yeah, this is going to hurt, mate. <laughs> um <clears throat> Lord of Ruins on the other hand though, a bit more of a controlly defensive piece. Um, he brings the buff for like play burst crawls as well, but he gives his unit the reroll wound rolls. So what this guy does, he kind of turns Death Shroud into like a pseudo shooting overwatch control unit, which is really interesting. It's what I'm using at the moment. Um, really great for punishing melee armies. Again, providing buffs backfield with play burst crawlers. Definitely less of a melee powerhouse than the Lord of Contagion and the buff that he brings. Um, I wouldn't really bring the Lord of the Lord of Villains in a three man squad. You can do it, it's nothing wrong with it. But I like the fact that I'm getting the most out of the reroll wounds because I want the flamer overwatch to be as devastating as possible to really deter people from making those movements. So I see him more of a control piece. Sorcerer Lord, 
all about defense. You've got the once per game super spell, which is really good. But again, it's a casino cannon. Sometimes it rolls hot, sometimes it does nothing, and it's once per game. So we look really we're looking more at the overall impact that he can do. Um, <clears throat> but defensively, he gives the unit minus one to be uh, minus one damage in close combat, which, given that's a two command point stratagem, is really good. Uh, and it can also combo with the stratagem, so you can turn flat damage three to damage one. Um, really good again. <laughs> so. If you're more about the defense there, um, I'd probably look at the Sorcerer Lord. Because again, if you're the Sorcerer Lord in the squad of Death Shroud, the minus one to wound, the minus one to uh, damage in close combat, and if you took the minus one weapon skill, ballistic skill, they can be minus one to hit. So really nice, you got minus one everything. Great, great defensive profile. <clears throat> Chaos Lord's a weird one. He's like a hybrid of like a utility offensive piece. So real ones to hit, it's nice, it's cute, it's not as good as Lord of Contagion. But, Man Reapers do hit on twos anyway, so you will reroll all the misses. The difference is you can't fish for lethals, because you can't reroll all hits and fish for it. So not as good at slapping really tough units, but still, it means you can't really get screwed by, you know, bad rolls and get a load of ones, because you can reroll them. Um, he slaps decently hard, nowhere near as hard as Lord of Contagion, but decently enough. Uh, more so than Lord of Virulence, more so than Sorcerer Lord. <coughs> and he has the weird... Aura of his contagion range pulses mortal wounds on a four up, which is quite decent, and sometimes it can get you really cheeky kills you have no right to get. <clears throat> but again, you're kind of all coming back down to how many four ups can you roll and how many guys can you get within the aura. So he's not too bad if you want to chuck him into the heart of the opponent's army, try and get as many mortal wounds as you can off on the ability. But overall, it can be a bit hard to use. Uh, and then Typhus, yeah, Typhus, good. <laughs> Typhus, uh. He's got the flat free damage weapon, he's got the d6 mortal wounds at range, and he gives the unit minus one to be hit in close combat, which can combo with the minus weapon skill ballistic skill to make his unit minus two to hit at all times in close combat. Um, Typhus is just really good in general. I still run Typhus solo because I like doing actions and smiting with him. When I say smite, I mean the mortal wounds thing. But putting him in a squad of death shroud is also just a really good choice as well. So all these choices are good, all these choices are viable. Um, and the one thing that Death, Sh Death Shroud are really good at is stacking defences. The minus wants to be wounded naturally um, if they're being led. So that's why you always want to have a character with this squad. Um, so, But again, you can see the stacking buffs here. You get the minus weapon skill, ballistic skill. Then you bring in Typhus. Now you're minus one uh, to hit as well as that. Or you bring the Sorcerer Lord. You're minus one damage as well as minus one to hit and wound potentially. Um, all sorts of things. The only one that doesn't really add to the defences is the Lord of Contagion. He's full offence. But even then, you're still getting the minus one to be wounded. So always bring a character. Lord of Virulence, again, doesn't bring a direct buff to defences. But he brings that counter charge control because people don't want to take 8d6 overwatch with full rerolls. I guarantee you that much. Um, on here is just a quick comp, some quick combos and a couple screen units here to, as we, again, we talked about before. Typhus plus the minus one ballistic skill weapon skill, really good. Nurglings nearby plus the minus one weapon skill ballistic skill can keep you at minus two to hitting close combat from things that aren't vehicles, so that's really good. So, you know, you're getting charged, you, you're deep striking some Nurglings behind your guys because you know a charge is coming. Now you've got the weapon skill ballistic skill contagion and the Nurglings. The charge units minus two to hit. You're making Marines hit on five. So it's really good. <clears throat> Sorcerer Lord plus Disgustingly Resilient. Again, you can drop three damage down to one damage. Really funny when you pull it off because people expect a one shot of Death Shroud and now doing a third of the Death Shroud's health per swing. Really funny. You can really swing games. <clears throat> um, and you have other stuff like Playcast. You can give units minus one to wound in close combat and also minus two to move and charge which makes the charge initially just harder and these can also stack which is kind of gross minus six to charge is a hell of a drug um, and i've been enjoying it a lot recently it's just kind of funny to tell the custodies yeah you move one inch and you charge at minus six have fun <laughs> it's just kind of comical um <clears throat> so we have quite a lot of defensive tools available and this is again this is on top of other stuff we talked about heroic interventions with fights first all these little things we can do Again, the more going to be covered in the advanced uh, video that's going to come out. But right now, these are just a couple combos that you can try out to get the most defensive combos out of Death Guard. And then screening units, we've got Poxwalkers and Cultists, obviously. Pretty straightforward. These guys are great, just standing in the way and absorbing charges. 
And Nurglings, uh, people might not know this, uh, Nurglings with Infiltrate, they can deploy anywhere on the board. Um, these guys can stop scout. Um, so World Eaters usually will scout like two or three units forward, six inches, which lets them get that first turn aggressive charge. It, but what you can't do is you can't finish a scout move within nine inch of an enemy unit, which means if you have Nurglings and actually deploy them in front of the World Eaters army, where they're gonna try and scout, they can't scout at all because they can't finish a move in nine of the Nurglings. So by doing that, you can buy yourself an entire turn worth of pressure off your army. So again, remember little things like that. <clears throat> but overall, to wrap up, sort of, why do I think learning melee is so important? I think melee is one of the best uses to get player skill expression. Um, there's, you will not see anywhere as interesting in the shooting phase as you will in the fight phase. There's lots of tricks to maximise plays, which will allow you to sort of develop skills and see opportunities as a player, which are really going to help you become like you know a good player. You're going to learn to be like, oh, I can do this here, I can do that there. Oh, I remember this one trick I can do. You can't really do that too much in the shooting phase. It's a lot more limited. <clears throat> Another reason I like melee is it's interaction with the opponent. There's a lot of back and forth in melee. It's a lot more interactive than, hey, I shot you from 48 miles away because I'm Tao, you're dead, the end. Um, and interaction with the opponent is the most fun part of Warhammer for me. Um, it is a second movement phase when you understand that. Movement is the most important part of 40k. So having access to the second movement phase of charging is incredibly important to learn and maximise as possible. And also, um, it causes problems to your opponent, can put your opponent in really bad situations, which then challenges them as a player, and you'll see how they react. And when if you are against someone that maybe isn't as comfortable at dealing with these situations, you can capitalize on punishing them. You know, they've made bad reactive moves, they didn't screen, they didn't do all these sort of things to deny you charges, you can punish it. Um, which is then, again, good for your board state and making aggressive plays, etc. So, summary. Always look for charges. Doesn't mean always take the charges, but always look for charges. Just look when it's your charge phase, just look over and be like, you know what, those coins could try an 11 inch charge. Because if I make it, I tie up that Redeemer. Not the worst. Are they going to die next turn anyway? Yeah, probably. Okay, fuck it. Let's try it. 11 inches, go. I rolled a three. But again, if there was no harm to it, no loss. Uh, remember, you can't be overwatched if you fail a charge. Because you haven't made a charge move. So if you roll the dice and fail a charge, your opponent can't overwatch you. Just be aware of that. <coughs> um, risk and reward. Like I said, think about the fail state of a charge. Think about the success rate of a charge. What happens in each scenario? What will it force my opponent to do? Will I just lose a unit for free if I fail this? Is there any other option though? Or do I have to take this crazy play? Sometimes you do. <coughs> so understand that. Try to pre-plan your charges, so don't go shooting the unit you want to charge. Try and think where you want to be, so this way it's going to help your shooting priority as well. Hey, I want to charge this unit here in turn 3, but it's got a screening unit. Let's use the mortars to kill the screen, which is then going to allow that charge to happen the following turn. Try and pre-plan this stuff. Try and be in good position. Again, staging with rhinos is really important. That's pre-planning. All these things. <clears throat> Look at multi-phase impact. So... Yes, the charge and the fight phase is the charge and the fight phase, but what can this do to impact your opponent's movement phase? What can this do to impact your opponent's shooting phase? That's the real magic of melee. I have tagged this unit. This unit now has to fall back. Now it can't shoot. So I've interrupted its movement phase and its shooting phase. I have blocked off this alleyway that this land raider was trying to get down. I have now controlled and basically blocked his movement phase for a turn. All these kind of things uh, are going to be very important and have impact far outside of just the fight and charge phase and don't forget trading <clears throat> it's great and well to do these crazy plays that block things off but if you're sacrificing you know 400 point unit of terminators and a character to block a land raider moving for one turn probably not worth it so always remember the rule of trading we don't want to give too much away for free do it with 10 cultists do it with free nurglings don't do it with a 500 point unit um but again it, it's, it's fairly straightforward that but yeah, uh, and I remember guys, a win for Death Guard is a win for Kirby, who apparently didn't want to walk anymore on this walk, so this is what Kirby does when he's tired of walking. Um, he just plops. Funny little guy. <laughs> but yeah, um, thank you uh, for sticking with this. Again, so this is just the first of a two-parter. Second one's going to be a lot more advanced techniques and tricks, ways to get around fights first, ways to get around 
um, you know, multiple units charging to different things and actually fighting into things you didn't declare a charge as. All sorts of crazy stuff. Ways to trick your opponent into basically screwing themselves over if they make a too little of a charge. All crazy stuff. We'll get into it though, don't worry. But for now, thank you so much. All the new pictures on here were sent by the Nurgle's Mansion Discord, our own Discord. So thank you so much for the pictures, guys. Hope your models got used on there. If you didn't see them, keep your eye out. They might be in the second half. Lots to do, lots and lots to do. Uh, more content is coming. <coughs> um, speaking of upcoming content, we do have... Uh, Steven Box is coming live on the channel on the 26th. I think it's next Tuesday. Let me just check the date. Uh, it is, yep, next Tuesday. We have a live stream of him. <coughs> so Steven Box from Vanguard Tactics is going to come on live with us, which will be really fun. I'm at the Manchester GT this weekend with Will, so we're going to have an after-action report kind of thing to talk about our games. Um, so lots of things coming up, and obviously the second part of this video, as I have said. But thank you very much for watching. Thank you to our sponsor, Saltai Games. If you want to get yourself some gaming aids to pick up, uh, especially disgustingly resilient themed ones, we have them. You can use promo code NURGLE to get yourself a discount and give us a bit of kickback to the channel. Link will be in the description. And if you want to learn how to up your game even more than you currently are, because hopefully this is helpful, <laughs> check out Vanguard Tactics. We have an affiliate link again below in the description. You can sign up for master classes on certain armies. Their academy course, I think, has just got filled up, so you won't be able to go into that. But they have other things like um, advanced learner programs, all sorts of stuff. Links are all below. Check it out. Great bunch of guys. Great for learning. I'm one of the coaches there. So maybe you get me. Um, unlucky for you, eh? <laughs> uh, and obviously to the YouTube members who are basically helping support and keep this entire crazy thing going. Uh, and you, of course, the viewer. Um, thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed it. I look forward to catching you on the second half. But for now, everyone. Have a good evening, uh, or morning, day, wherever you are. I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, regardless, stay right on, guys. I'll catch you in the next one. And wish me good luck at Manchester. <laughs> Take care, guys. See you later.